Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and for the organization. It's really an exciting meeting. Uh, I think that my talk will go pretty much in the direction, in spite of the title, uh, that could be confusing, in the direction of the, of the talk of uh, Alvaro today morning. And, but I will try to focus on a complementary aspect, uh, <coughs> namely, uh, it's a crucial problem, uh, how and where we uh, can uh, stimulate. So Alvaro has shown very beautifully today morning that we have the technology for characterizing brain activity, we have the technology and the science for characterizing, for quantifying this brain activity. We have also the technology for modifying brain activity, <coughs> but still we have a crucial problem, that this modification, this stimulation, is dealing with an extremely complex system, technically a non-linear dynamical system, so that our intuition most of the time it's not working. I cannot stimulate and expect some, uh, some uh, targeted results because it could be totally different. And the way to solve this problem is really by modeling. So I, I, I mentioned here just uh, the possibilities of our stimulation, TMS or DBS or electrical or alternate uh, electrical stimulation, but exactly the same framework could be applied to other type of stimulations as we heard uh, in the last session, for example, perceptual stimulation, auditory stimulation, or even pharmacological st stimulation. Let me start just with a, a cartoonized version of the, of the framework. So we have a healthy brain, in a particular brain state, let's say the most simple natural brain state, resting state, and this is characterized by a, a very well specific type of brain activity. So that we know, I mean, could be split in resting state networks and so on. I simplify here and I put that these healthy dynamics could be, uh, could be thought as a kind of a landscape where a little ball is moving. Of course, it's not so simple as that, it's just a, a, a visualization. Now, let's imagine that we have, for some reason, a, a disease brain with some neuropsychiatric disease, that, uh, but because of uh, unbalance of neurotransmitter, because of damage uh, or whatever, the dynamics is distorted in the way as is shown in the, in, the, in the figure. Then one possibility is to try to restore normality by controlling exactly the trajectory with the stimulation. And this is a clear possibility that we can try to follow. It's very difficult because we have to control the trajectory in this uh, high-dimensional spatio-temporal space with a stimulation. Some labs are going in that direction, for example, Danny Bassett Labs in the US. Our philosophy is pretty different. I mean, what we will try is to design a stimulation and solving what I mentioned before, the how and where problem, by trying to restore the dynamics. And then by restoring the dynamics, we hope <coughs> that homeostatically, plasticity will act in the right uh, direction and will restore the, the brain in the long term. So we are not trying to model the control of a specific trajectory. We are not uh, trying to, to model the, the effect of plasticity, which is, by the way, a nightmare, but we are trying just to restore this, uh, this uh, general uh, dynamical states. The way of doing that is with uh, whole brain modeling. Uh, um, whole brain modeling has some traditions uh, since 15, 20 years. Actually, we started, I think, together with Victor Schirza. Uh, uh, here, and Randy McIntosh, and the idea is very simple. I mean, the, the, the mathematical uh, explanations could be more complicated, but the idea is basically to try to explain the global effect of the dynamics that we can characterize with neuroimaging in all the different varieties, uh, fMRI, EMG, EEG, whatever is your favorite technique, by linking explicitly the real existing coupling given by the anatomy that usually is coming through anatomical studies in animals track tracing, in humans in general nowadays non-invasive, it's also using DTI tractography, and by coupling then the local dynamics that we express mathematically for the different regions, through this anatomical connection we try to express and to find uh, the parameters that explain what we measure in the reality. And we can do this at the group level or we can do this at the individual level. So the, 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 what we need is, of course, is a good characterization of this uh, brain activity. 
in the Amparture for, and, and in the Parturf uh, estates. And there are many techniques, uh, just to give you a flavor and without going into the details because I don't have the time. Uh, actually, I have the time because the clock stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> that means I, I can talk so much as I want. Eh? <laughs> okay. Uh, the time. <laughs> okay. Um, then, uh, the, so one very simple intuitive idea is, for example, to describe explicitly the spatial-temporal patterns. So you can imagine that in each time point, you take a snapshot of your state of your system, for example, the state of synchronization, then you clusterize those states, you divide, so you, you can imagine as a cloud in the spatial-temporal space, and then you clusterize the different position in the cloud, and then you describe this probabilistically. So for given brain state, for given individual conditions, you are spending more time in one or the other uh, <coughs> uh, uh, cluster of the, of the total uh, system. Having this, we have all the elements. So we, have the, we could have the data, we could have the quantification of the data, namely this probabilistic state space description, and we have a modeling of the data. And now we can really go to the, to the central part of the problem. So how we force, how we design a, a, a perturbation, again, electromagnetic pharmacological perturbation, that uh, is designed so that we provoke a given transition. For example, in the clinical context, it's clear the, the, the transition that we will try to achieve is going from a, a particular individual state of a diseased person with schizophrenia, depression, stroke, whatever, to the normal healthy state. Uh, and, and we are able to describe that. And the idea is basically to model at the individual level under a particular condition, usually resting state, but uh, of that particular, let's say, a patient, and try to find in silico, after exhaustively uh, uh, exploration of all possible sites, then we solve the wear problem, and all possible, well, not all possible, but some possible protocols, for example, synchronization or noisy protocols, and to design which one is really able to move these individual patients to a state that is more congruent with the, uh, with the healthy state that we gain through a group uh, uh, analysis. In fact, I mean, this is a, there is a name there, Nemesis is a project where we are trying to do that explicitly in the context of a stroke. Actually, it's an ERC in energy that we got uh, with Mavi last, uh, well, at the beginning of this year and with two neurologists more from Italy, Mauricio Corvetta, a specialist on, a, uh, on a stroke, and uh, Marcello Massimini. <coughs> and we try to apply this idea to concrete patients, really to do this study in silico, and then to use possible TMS or electrical stimulation in order to promote this, uh, this transition to, to uh, a restored uh, functional um, state. And concomitantly, then we can apply uh, uh, usual rehabilitation, but the rehabilitation will be more effective uh, than the usual rehabilitation because the brain is in a good state because we provoke that particular transition in that particular time. Just to give you a flavor and to, to, to finish my talk, I mean, uh, there are some preliminary work uh, on that. Actually, the ERC is in energy is, is starting next October, so we don't have results for that. <laughs> But uh, we have six years for that. <laughs> but uh, there are some previous results. For example, uh, this one that we published a couple of years ago in PNAS, where we took really empirical data, human subjects, healthy, in two uh, particular brain states, wakefulness and sleep. And what you see there is the probability uh, uh, state space, so with the, these color bars, uh, the empirical data the whole brain model adjusted to the group level, in this case, in both brain state, wakefulness and sleep. And you see first two things, that's the empirical and the whole brain in the same states, they are very equal. So it means the model is really doing a very good job. Uh, and of course, the wakefulness in empirical or whole brain uh, is very different from the sleep one. And now we apply this philosophy, so modeling, for example, in this case, sleep, and trying to target the wavefulness state. And we were able to show that, that in silico, there are some regions which are, and with some specific protocols, 
they are more prone to promote this particular transition. So to, that's what we call this framework, awakening, because uh, that was the first application that we had. Um, other type of applications, for example, also healthy group, that was a huge uh, project in Catalonia, uh, comprising more than 2,000 people. It uh, was an aging project called Imaginoma. <coughs> The, and we divided uh, this, uh, this group of old people uh, in two groups, the one with cognitive decline and uh, healthy cognitive decline and one without uh, um, cognitive decline. And we have done exactly the same exercise at the group level still. Uh, so we model the, the cognitive decline uh, states and then we study uh, which region are the one which are more prone if we perceive that in a given way, in this case was a, a noise and a synchronization protocol, the one that was working was the noise protocol, uh, we can promote the transition to the healthy uh, resting state of those individuals. And just last example, and I, I finish, also to give you a flavor, we are trying also in the context of other projects, uh, the ministry level, uh, and with collaborations in, in France, in the, the Neurospin, to try to see if we can do the same uh, with coma patients. These also are a, a set of, actually coming from two different labs, from Paris and from Liege, of coma patients, and we have done exactly the same game. We took, now in this case, for each individual person, a model, a person in, in deep coma, and we were trying to <coughs> achieve the transition to the healthy state. And uh, I don't have the time to go into the details, but what come out are the regions which are rendered here, which are more prone really to, to achieve that and are candidates uh, for promoting this transition, or at least are revealing something that is interesting per se, even if we don't plan at the end of the day to perturb that. It's revealing through this perturbation trick, the sensitivity of those very particular regions to the problem that we are analyzing. So summing up, I mean, uh, I hope that my take home message is clear. I think we need, I mean, I, I don't know another alternative. I, I, I would, uh, just to be provocative, be extremist. I think it's the only way really to solve the how and where problem that we have in the stimulation. As I say, pharmacological or electromagnetic stimulation. Uh, we cannot use our intuition. We can use the try and error experimentally for ethical reasons and for pragmatic reasons because we don't have the time for doing that, but in silico we can do whatever we want. We don't need to be ethical, and we can be exhaustively. Uh, and we hope that, in fact, I mean, we are <coughs> fighting for going into the, the translational applications. Thank you.